Thank you very much for coming to this uh, one hour session, um, a discussion on artificial intelligence, how to ensure, or how do we ensure it benefits patients. And we're going to structure it in three parts. So first of all, there'll be an introduction to the panelists. I will also say who I am. Uh, that'll take 12 to 15 minutes because I'm going to ask them to say a little bit about why they're here and what their relevant expertise might be to today's discussion. Then I'll ask them some questions about the topic for about 30 minutes or so. And the last 15 to 20 minutes, we'll throw it open to you. If you're right at the top, you'll have to wave quite hard so we can see you. Um, but we want to hear from the public. It is a topic um, that has been very much in the news. If only in the last 24, 48 hours, you know, Babylon have announced that uh, um, they are going to move into another area of the country and invert commas possibly replace the local GPs. Uh, they run various algorithms to decide whether you're sick enough to come in or not. Is that something that the public welcomes? Uh, maybe we can touch upon that in the discussion. But I'm sure that you're all very interested in, in the topic, that's why you're here, and therefore I want to leave plenty of time at the end for, for discussion. So, let me say who I am. First of all, I am the uh, head of the engineering department in the university, um, but 10 years ago I set up uh, the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, which is really engineering and computer science applied to health. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an institute now of about 250 people, engineers, computer scientists on, on the medical campus. So we have a number of work streams, including one which is AI and machine learning and applying it to healthcare data. Um, and I, the reason why I'm chairing this is that I, I am also the theme leader of the Biomedical Research Center for Technology and Digital Health. And I'm sure you know the Biomedical Research Center brings together uh, researchers from the university uh, and clinicians from the UH Trust and some people have a dual appointment. And I can see some of the people from the theme here in the audience today. So that's who I am. Um, I'm going to turn to each of the speakers and ask them to introduce themselves. I'm going to give the first speaker a bit more time than the others because I think um, it's Professor Chris Holmes, but it'd be good for him to not only introduce himself, but say a little bit about uh, AI and healthcare. So, Chris, if you go first, and then I'll introduce Angeliki, Fred, and Nick afterwards. You hear me? Oh, wow, okay, yeah. I'm not very good with technology, you'll see. Um, so, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, thank you, Lionel. So I'm uh, Professor uh, Chris Holmes, and I kind of have two roles of interest here. So one is I have a, uh, a chair in, uh, in statistics in the Department of Statistics, and that's a joint chair, joint statutory professorship between the medical school and the mathematics uh, school down the road. I am the first joint chair between the medical uh, division and the mathematics division, and I'm sure I won't be the last. And my, my research interests are in an area of AI called machine learning, which is how can we take algorithms, you can think about them as kind of computer uh, programs that kind of write themselves. So the traditional approach to computer modeling would be you kind of write uh, programs to do something. Well, machine learning, you can think about it as a computer program that learns by itself through exposure to its environment. And so the interest here would be if we have a large corpus of medical histories across a population, can the algorithm itself learn about the associations between, say, genetics and particular disease risks? or age, or obesity, or other measures that we might take on individuals. And so my kind of interests are in that kind of technical background of developing new algorithms, specifically in the focus of health. Uh, so that's kind of one side, or one half of my world. The other half of my world is in a place called the Alan Turing Institute, and that's the National Institute for AI and Data Science. Uh, that's based in the British Library, uh, in near King's Cross and as the National Institute that spans 13 leading research universities, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Edinburgh, Warwick, uh, you can look online and, and, and see the list. 
Uh, and in the Alan Turing Institute, I'm Programme Director for Health. So I oversee all of the uh, AI research in the National Institute that covers uh, medical uh, applications, medical and health applications. And I guess just the thing to note, and I'm sure that's partly why you're here, there's been an explosion of interest uh, in the use of AI in the medical environment. And that comes from, I guess, uh, two or three factors. One, a recognition that we can utilize data at scale, at population scale, yeah, in order to do better medicine uh, through learning algorithms. Yeah? But coupled to that, we need the advances in computer science. And it's really these kind of, we're in this incredible era where there's been advances in bigger, faster computers coupled with new techniques for learning algorithms, but plus this understanding and governmental support that if we gather the data at population scale, we can utilize that for patient good. Thank you. Th thank you, Chris. So over to Angeliki to introduce yourself. Thank you, Angeliki. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's great to see so many of you here. My name is Angeliki Kerasidou. I'm a senior researcher at the Ethox Center at the Wellcome Center for Ethics and Humanities here in Oxford. Uh, my background is in theology and philosophy, and I've been working in the area of bioethics for more than 10, 15 years now. Um, so in my work, what I'm interested in is to investigate and look at the ways in which new technologies, including AI, are changing the moral landscape of clinical medicine and research. And in this context as well, to look at the ethical issues that arise in this new, in, in this new moral landscape, as well as look at the kind of duties and obligations that emerge in this new context for the actors involved. Um, and I think that um, AI is a very kind of uh, interesting and potentially exciting area and so something that I think has the potential to really revolutionize the way that we do medicine and the way that we deliver care. Uh, and I think that the most crucial thing from an ethics but also probably practical point of view is to look at the future and try to think about what kind of healthcare do we want, what kind of system of healthcare, what kind of principles and values do we want our healthcare to, uh, to reflect and then work backwards and use the best technologies available to us to help us deliver that vision and, and that, that future. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fred, please. <clears throat> Hello, so uh, my name is Fred Kemp. Um, I am the Deputy Head of Licensing and Ventures for Oxford University of Innovation. Um, for those of you that don't know uh, Oxford University Innovation, um, we manage all the intellectual property and innovation that's coming out of the university um, and also the two local NHS trusts, the Oxford University Hospitals Trust and Oxford Health. Um, and for those of you that uh, have, have been into the hall next door, you will see just how much is going on um, in this space and why this is perhaps you know, the most exciting job I've ever had, uh, but also one of the most challenging ones for sure. Um, so our role really is to maximize the impact of all the you know, excellent research that's going on. Um, I joined about uh, six years ago uh, and I joined uh, to look after software, so there was just me managing all the software across the whole of the university. Um, I now have a team of six that's focused just on digital health and I think that reflects Chris's point um, earlier about the explosion of, um, sort of digital related uh, healthcare activity that's going on uh, and the scale of the opportunity that we see um, in, in front of us. Um, and increasingly within that, absolutely more and more in terms of the AI. Um, and therefore we get very involved uh, sort of working backwards from the sort of what's the opportunity, how do you get these things out into the real world back to make sure all those processes are in place early on so that the structures are right, the data sharing agreements and things like that uh, are all constructed in an appropriate manner. Um, so we cover that sort of full spectrum. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just the most exciting place I think to be um, and everyone who's got to stand next door needs to uh, come and talk to me. So, thanks. Thank okay, over to Nick. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Excuse me. So my name is Nick Scott Ram. I'm VP Strategy and Commercial Development at a company called Sensine Health. And my background has been in the life sciences industry and then before Sensine working at the Oxford Academic Health Science Network around the adoption of innovation, particularly around digital innovations. At Sensine, we have uh, developed a model of working with the NHS whereby 
in exchange for equity in the company and in terms of royalties that come out of uh, use of anonymized data, we've developed a model where there's a fair return that goes back into the NHS in exchange for using clinical AI on the basis of assessing anonymized data according to all the IG governance requirements within the NHS, which we see as very, very important. The ability to be able to use the AI on top of this anonymized data then allows us to ask specific research questions are centered on patient benefit, either in discovery research, finding new targets for novel therapies, or improving clinical trials or analyzing clinical trials in terms of how you may stratify patients, or in looking at real world outcomes where particularly you might want to look at how larger populations respond to specific drugs in terms of outcomes or potentially looking at drug-drug interactions. Uh, the company also went public last year. Also part of this approach of saying you have to be completely transparent in terms of what you're doing with the data so that everybody can see what the process is. And in relation to AI, it's very important to have the transparency across this journey from data what algorithms you use on the AI, and then going into what the outputs are, so that there's a clear regulatory framework and a transparency across that. And I'm sure these are some of the issues that we may come on to talk about a bit later. Thank you very much, everybody. I've, um, I'm going to try and set, ask a set of questions to one person, but I'm hoping the others on the panel will come in. And I'll start with Chris um, about so there have obviously been some reports already at the Academy of Medical Sciences and others have looked at um, AI and how the patients, public and so on, respond to it. Um, and by and large, if I could summarize, people say, okay, if I can see clearly how the AI algorithm is going to bring about a benefit to patients, then I'm all for it. Um, but of course, there may be some gray areas, so I was wanting to see whether we could kick off the discussion, Chris, by could you give us an example where it's very clear how AI will really help either the healthcare system or patients, and one where it might be less clear, and then I'll bring in the others to, to, to uh, see whether they've got similar opinions to you. One very clear one first. Okay, so, uh, so I think probably in, in terms of the, a, you know, the poster child of AI has really been on image recognition. And so I think assisting, and, and I think that's a key word, assisting and augmenting uh, kind of uh, uh, clinical uh, uh, diagnostics and clinical advice is the key part of it. So I think uh, one where there's clear benefit is assisting, say, radiologists to screen enormous numbers of images and, and allow them the time yeah, so this is this phrase now that says that one of the great benefits of AI is that we hope that it will give clinicians time. Yeah, so, so allow kind of the human expert to focus in on where they have most impact. So I think one clear area of benefit will be in AI image analysis to allow uh, expert radiologists to concentrate resources and their time on those images that really require uh, that expert and screen out ones that, that are more obvious. And of course the AI algorithm can, can actually even bring their attention to the more difficult ones when they're looking at Precisely. The so how do you augment clinical decision making? So maybe focus in on parts of the image uh, where you think that there's an abnormality or even pull in other images. You know, have we seen you know, patients that look kind of similar to this in, in, in the past? So I think those are clear areas, clinical decision support where AI will have a really positive benefit. So a tougher question. Um, whether you want to bring genetics into it, that's entirely up to you, but tougher questions where it might not be so obvious and you have uh, a more difficult decision to make as an AI researcher whether, and I'll bring Angelique in later to discuss the ethics. So yeah. can you think of an example where it's not so clear cut? Well, I think there's, there's some challenges in AI around um, that come from, say, training set bias. I think in particular in areas of kind of public health is quite complicated to try and infer associations. So I'll try and just unpack that slightly. Uh, so you can think about an AI algorithm, you know, essentially you're kind of feeding it information under the door. So imagine an algorithm, imagine you sitting in a room and I'm feeding information under, under the door and all you get to see is the data that's being fed through. You don't have it, clearly the algorithm has no context, yeah? 
So it doesn't have a kind of a contextual understanding of where, it's, where it is kind of in the world. And I think uh, what that means is in terms of like, you know, public health, say environmental health, yeah, looking at the impact of pollution, yeah. What the algorithm learns is a function of how that data was created. And so there I think the associations, um, because they're more complex, uh, it's less clear to me. I think we've got quite a way to go in terms of, of using that, those sorts of information. So one other example of that would be, for example, uh, an algorithm that learns to predict your risk of developing diabetes. And we know that diabetes is different according to different ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. So if you train the algorithm with one missing, uh, one ethnic group missing, then actually once you try the algorithm on a person from that particular ethnic group, it would probably get it wrong because it wasn't yes. part of the training set. So this, the discussions about how we train, training bias and so on, is it people like you or is it people like Angeliki who should be making those decisions? Well, I think it's a combination. And so, for example, at the Alan Turing Institute, we have a, a theme in algorithmic fairness. And so this says, well, if you're training algorithms, you want their prediction, say, or prediction fairness to be invariant yeah, to certain features. So, for example, ethnicity. And actually, that's kind of an interesting one. So what you're saying to the algorithm, we want you to learn from data but you want to be kind of invariances kind of built in, which means that you don't bias your prediction based on, say, uh, ethnic background or gender or age, well, for certain, uh, uh, for certain diseases. But I think, yeah, exactly, it's a combination of things. And maybe so, Angelique, do you see that ethicists should be involved in those decisions? Um, and a follow-up question to what um, Chris was saying, you know, you gather the data, you get the answer, you get a risk score. Now, you've got no idea, it's a black box, we often say, where it's come from, why the algorithm is making that decision. Is that something we should be worried about? Um, well, to answer the, the, the first question, I think absolutely that ethicists and scientists should work together in these type of questions. And why is that? Because we want, as I said in the beginning, we want to first kind of decide where we want to go, what kind of values, what kind of healthcare do we want. And once we, and this is not just a practical question, it's also an ethical question to, to answer. And once we kind of, between us, come up to, the, to that answer, then we can uh, get the scientists on board and say, okay, help us deliver that. that future of, of healthcare. Um, so I think absolutely, and, and ethics, um, just to kind of add, is there to really support good science and good research. Ethicists are not there to just stop things from happening, but facilitate and make sure that all the benefits really reach the public and that society progresses in the way that we want society to progress. Um, in terms of, kind of the, the problem of, of the black box, I think that this is a very interesting um, question and it's one of these issues that AI uh, has brought about kind of an interesting ethical question that was not there before. Because it's not the first time that medicine uses technology to help deliver better healthcare. It's not the first time that we're using machines. But I think it's probably the first time that we're using machines that do not just extend our physical capacities. It's not just like the stethoscope that allows us to hear more or an X-ray machine that we can see more, but it kind of allows us to make better decisions. So what it's enhancing is our decision making capacity in a way as, as healthcare professionals. So being able to interrogate that machine and say why did you make that decision rather than a different decision or for the healthcare professional who's facing the patient and say well I recommend this to you because uh, you know you need to be able to answer that because question. And what is also quite important to, to bear in mind, and I think this is an interesting probably uh, practical problem, scientific practical problem, and maybe there are answers about that, is how do we build value plurality into our algorithm systems? Because there is not only one answer that fits everyone. The answer to what will be the best treatment for you, the best care pathway for you, will be different if you ask me and if you ask uh, Nick, if you ask someone else. And so the, the machine should be able to accommodate that value plurality that we see as being very important in the way that we deliver healthcare. And I'm not putting that out there as a problem, but more as a challenge in the way that uh, humans and machines in healthcare uh, collaborate together to provide the type of care that we think that we need. Okay, well I'm going to go on to recommendations and bring in um, our commercial colleagues on, on the left, because of course we all know about recommendations, you know, I'm sure pretty well everybody here would have used Amazon and as soon as you've done your purchase you get a recommendation as to what else you might be interested in purchasing. Now let's imagine that um, you allow your healthcare data to go to one of these commercial companies 
And let's imagine first that they've trained the algorithm on all the NHS data that's available for, for that disease. Is it then all right to uh, go back to people who've got that particular condition and recommend treatments directly based on, so you train an algorithm to stratify, is what we call it, divide patients into different categories, uh, and we can do that. Um, how do we then use that information, given that maybe my, my risk of um, heart attack or stroke is higher? Is it all right for commercial companies then to be able to go and market a particular treatment directly to, uh, to the patient? Is, is, is that something you would have any qualms at OUI if a company came to you and said, I can set up an AI-based marketing um, and I'd like to work with the pharma company one and I'm sure we can increase their market shares by 20% uh, on the basis of this algorithm. Would that be something you'd be happy with, Fred? I was hoping to pass that question to Nick first. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, th I think um, it comes down to trust and appropriate regulation, largely. Um, I was going to ask Chris and Angelique a question about at what point can we actually trust uh, an AI system, um, whether it's augmenting the clinical decision making or as a patient that it's given the right answer. Uh, lots of opportunities there, I think, to discuss around, you know, also the reduction of false, pos pos sorry, false negatives, the, sorry, false, false positives, the unnecessary treatments that might be delivered. I think specifically to the recommendation piece, you know, there's an obvious opportunity um, where patient benefit might be realized if, for example, it's about trial recruitment. So, so actually uh, helping patients with that particular condition be more involved in the research that might lead to an improvement directly in that. Whether we go to the full extent of saying this is an AI treatment that, um, you know, re creates a recommendation from a drug uh, for a new treatment um, is perhaps a more difficult question. I think the analogy within the pharma world at the moment is the companion diagnostics we see where, you know, there are very good companion diagnostics which allow you to differentiate whether a treatment would actually be useful to a patient, whether they would actually respond to that particular um, pharmaceutical. So I think where it is delivering a potential you know, clear commercial, um, patient benefit in that, um, I think yes, we would absolutely be comfortable with moving in that direction. Um, if it is simply uh, part of that sort of uh, marketing process to try and boost the sales, I think we would be far more um, challenged uh, by that. I mean, Nick, if Nick do you want to have a go as well? Yeah, so I, um I see the key step if you've developed an insight is actually how you're going to validate and test it against a clinical population working with a clinician in patients as part of the requirements of developing a regulatory package. Whatever you do within the pharmaceutical industry or medical devices and AI is a similar area, you've actually got to ensure that you've tested something within a clinical population to demonstrate its utility or efficacy and safety. And if you can't do that, and you can't then get the regulatory approvals, then that's something that shouldn't be sold back into patients in any particular way. I think you've also got to be very careful how you distinguish between clinical utility and what is used in the consumer-facing space as well, which are very, very different. And you get a lot of uh, apps and technologies which are developed in a consumer-facing space, which try and infer particular claims, but which really haven't been properly validated. So our point of view, from an industry point of view, is you've got to have a very clear, clinically regulated pathway that says you test, if you get the right results, you then go through an approval submission process with the regulators, and only then, when you've actually got that approval, can you then sell that back into patients or through people that actually will use that. To then go into a very clear consumer society position from that is a very different step and I think opens up a whole range of other questions which one should not do. So there is, if you look at it within the uh, global perspective, there's a pharmaceutical regulated or an industry regulated pathway which you could compare with some of the other tech companies which don't go down quite such a strong regulatory pathway. And I think we have to be very clear about that actually you've got to do the testing and the regulation is absolutely central to the whole process in terms of patient safety and governance. Okay, well, thank you very much. Very comprehensive answers. I'm going to come back to the testing in a minute. But before I want, oh, I'm going to ask the same question to all four panellists. 
and Angelique, he should go last and have the longest answer, all right? So it's recommendations. This is a true story. It happened to a colleague of mine in the university. So if I'm driving to Northampton, say, just picking a town not far from Oxford for breakfast, and if I have my phone on and GPS is switched on, before I even got there for my breakfast meeting, I'll have three recommendations um, of where it might be a nice place to have breakfast. They'll know that I'm keen on continental. They'll, they'll, they'll probably pick a place where I can get some pastries. Um, and most of us have probably experienced that. All you need to do is to have your phone and GPS switched on. What happened to a colleague of mine was when he was actually walking into uh, the cancer hospital for a, a first round of cancer treatment. Within 100 yards of the cancer hospital after he parked his car, he was given three recommendations of private cancer hospitals. Uh, because they'd learned over time the kind of appointments he kept, um, they knew that he was likely to have cancer, then the GPS told them that there was a cancer hospital nearby. So the algorithm combined all that information and recommended to him three alternative private cancer hospitals. And but the, the company that made those recommendations is probably being paid by those cancer hospitals to make those recommendations. So I'm going to ask all the panel, and Angeliki last, whether you believe that an AI algorithm that makes those types of recommendations is the, is you're okay with that? Starting with Chris and then Fred and Nick and finishing with Angeliki. Uh, okay, I'm probably the least qualified uh, to talk about that. So I'd be interested in, in developing the algorithms that could do that, yeah? Uh, <laughs> um, and so, but I think, but it, it, you know, it, is, it does open up a kind of a very interesting uh, question about the responsibility of AI researchers on the downstream uses of not only the algorithm as well, but also, uh, you know, on the data. And something I hope we kind of touch upon is that this, the, this value that comes in algorithms, yeah, it, it's not the value, I mean, the, it's, it's not the algorithm itself that's of any value. Yeah, an algorithm in its own is, is a little bit like a rocket, yeah. And if you've got no fuel, it's data that's the fuel, and it's the combination of those two things together. So I think um, uh, that's a really kind of important thing. I think in terms of, you know, would I have concern in terms of utilizing the, uh, utilizing those sorts of predictions? I think it very much depends on the, on the context. I think it depends, as was previously said, about personal utility. Yeah, so an algorithm can make predictions, but on top of that, we want to layer up on it you know, individual, what we would call utility preferences. For some individuals, they might really welcome having those sorts of recommendations provided to them. For other individuals, they might uh, be very averse to that. And I think there's a really interesting question about how do we build in or layer upon individual preferences around algorithms that are kind of learning at a population scale. That's a great answer, so moving it on. So, I, I completely agree. I think the responsibility, um, and, and as you know, one of the uh, organisations that, that sort of uh, tasked with maximising the impact of the kind of research that's coming out, um, you know, we will be involved in that process. If Chris developed that algorithm, um, we will be look, working with him to talk, perhaps, to a commercial organisation, and we would really want to understand how they were going to use the information that was being um, produced by that algorithm and how it was going to be delivered. I think the thing um, that I sort of considered straight away when I heard that story really was the analogy for um, the sort of genetic testing we see um, going on. There's lots of commercial organizations you can send off, you can get your genetic data back. But unless you have the, you know, the training and the understanding to be able to interpret that data, um, I think you know it, it's very very difficult. So you see, you know, the genetic that uh, genetic information is usually delivered back through uh, an expert, through a genetic counsellor who can actually help that person interpret it. I think you know, to, to Chris's point about the sort of personal preferences, simply having those three options placed in front of you would be quite a dangerous thing potentially. Um, and I would want to see any kind of algorithm that was able to make those kind of recommendations with the information delivered in a, in a much more nuanced way, I think, than, than just that. Here's three other ways you could get that treatment. At the same time, I think that choice, you know, there are those that would, would, would want that choice would be um, 
but they need to be able to make an informed decision about it, I think would be my sort of underlying point there. Thanks. I think um, I would be in agreement with the speakers who have gone ahead, because I think it's a question of what is the thin end of the wedge in this as well. So if you look in the US, uh, there have been incidences where people can type in on keyboards and then you get a pop-up menu saying, are you at risk of Parkinson's? Would you like to join in a clinical trial? Now, I personally think that's an invasion of your privacy and is wholly inappropriate. And I think you've got to be very open to the sensitivities of what people may or may not want. So I think having that kind of information coming about, here are three centres you should go and visit, I feel treads over the line. And again, you've got to be nuanced and careful about how you provide that information to people in different states of mind and at risk given particular medical conditions. So I think the ethics sits very much at the heart of it and then how you link that ethics to the regulation and what you can and can't do is key in this space. Angelique, you should have the last word. Thank you. It's a very interesting um, story and it's, I, think, I think at the heart of this problem is how much surveillance are we expect it or want to put up with it with in order to get some kind of outcome even if that outcome is better health care or better access to health care uh, and I think that is a, an open question and sometimes we kind of when we think of surveillance you think like oh that's a bit of a strong word right I mean we associate surveillance with mal you know malevolent dictatorships uh, in kind of countries away from us we are trying to kind of Con, uh, in a way constrict uh, us and our freedoms uh, and, uh, and do all sorts of bad things. But at the same time, I mean, the, what is happening when, you know, you switch on your phone and it's tracking every single movement of you and exactly where you're going, it's exactly the same type of surveillance. Like someone is getting all this information, they can make predictions and they can uh, suggest things to you. So it is a constraint of freedom. Whether we want that constraint of freedom in order to get that outcome is, is the first type of question we want. And, uh, to me, that answer is not very straightforward. I am not sure that better, well, better in inverted commas, what better healthcare would mean in this particular situation necessarily justifies that level of surveillance. But I think it's something that needs to be debated. The se and what is also problematic in these systems is that, as, as Chris said, some people might welcome that, some people might not. But how do we build into the system a way out for the people who will not want to do that? At the moment, that is not possible, you know. If you're using um, your Gmail account, um, you're, you cannot opt out. And a lot of kind of systems and a lot of processes and a lot of products are tied into that way of doing things. So people who would like not to be surveyed in the same level do not have an, a, a way out at the moment. And then moving that discussion into healthcare, there is one way you think that, oh, well, maybe when it comes to selling us shoes or selling us holidays, maybe it's absolutely fine. But do we want then healthcare to become the same level of commodity as selling holidays and cruises for, for your summer because someone identified as you were typing, you know, I want to go to the Greek islands. Um, and then say like, oh, well, this is a very, is, is healthcare the same time of product, the same kind of, of service that we would like also to include in this, in this way of organizing the system. So I think these are the questions that we need to think about. And I would argue that probably healthcare is a different type of good that is not the same as selling you yet another pair of shoes or a, ni a nice cruise in the Greek islands. I just say Again, it's great. I'd just like to add as well that, you know, if you think about it, the reason that that algorithm can make those predictions is because it's using your data. Yeah, so it wouldn't be able to make those predictions without each one of you in this hypothetical world allowing for your data to be used by the algorithm such that it could make that prediction. And so I think there's a very interesting question about the responsibility somewhere for saying how would you like wish your data to be used by an AI algorithm in order to make predictions. Yeah, well, I'm going to move on, but I, I, I do think it's a counterpoint because I thought the answer to that question was just switch GPS off. Then we learned actually that even if GPS is off, a certain provider knows where you are. Uh, so that's why it can be pernicious, um, and it's how much knowledge we have about the algorithms. Yes, exactly, and I think that is an important thing because sometimes you say, well, it's your choice. But a lot of the time, this is an empty choice. You don't actually, have, like, if you live in a world and you want to interact with other people and you want to be able to go to work and you have to use email and you have, the system has, in a way, organized itself in a way where 
the choice to opt out mm -hmm. is very, very, very difficult. I mean, how many of us do we go and read the terms and conditions every time we accept, like we visit the page and you and say, well, you cannot access that page unless you accept. And you accept because that's the way now to get the information. So, and if this is happening in the commercial world, outside healthcare, it is a question especially for the NHS because we do have a certain type of healthcare system in, the, in this country which is different to the one in the US. So if we want to continue that type of healthcare system, do we want this healthcare system to also uh, step in into that space of, of surveillance and commodification of this information? Maybe yes, I mean it's an open question but it's one that we need to think about rather than kind of allow ourselves to get to drift into that space without what without thinking. So I'll have a follow-up question. I'm going to have two more questions now and I'm going to ask um, Nick and Chris to answer the first one and Angeliki and Fred to answer the second one and I'll throw it open to everybody. So, so the first one was raised effectively and, uh, and Nick you raised it in the clinical pathway and you know a little bit like med tech devices, algorithms, drugs and so on. They're, certainly for medical devices and drugs, they're well-known ways of testing new medical devices or testing new drugs. And of course, we could test algorithms in exactly the same way, and both Chris and I have been involved in studies where that's been the case. But one of the things that happens with AI is you can continue to learn as you get more data. And if you switch an algorithm on and it becomes useful, people will start to contribute more data. So let's assume that you know my um, diabetes risk prediction score and so on, it will get better the more data that I have and I'll have more data as I know more and more outcomes and so on. So it's what we call you know, uh, online learning, for example. The algorithm continues to learn. Um, how can you then test or should we not allow the fact that algorithm can self-modify and continue to learn as more data is being fed? How can we possibly uh, imagine a world where AI algorithms self-modifying would still be used without these regular forms of testing, or is it a complete no-no? So Nick first and then Chris. That's a very good question, Lionel. Um, I think the first question in my mind is your confidence that you're actually getting the right answers out of the algorithm that you've developed. And that comes back to your confidence in the uh, size of the population and the variation across that population given that size. And so you actually have to go through a number of iterations to be able to get the confidence to say, well, is it 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 to be aware that you've actually got that right population size. If you're then going through an algorithm which is actually improving itself as you go through, that is something I think which is at the limits of the regulatory framework at the moment. The regulators are not very sure how you could actually uh, test for this and what type of framework to put in place that, I think you've got to have very, very close monitoring. And in clinical trial space, you have a thing called real-world evidence gathering, which is supplemental to the outcomes that you have in the clinical trial. And I think if you're going to go through that process, you have to have a very strong evidence gathering process where you've got those algorithms that modify. And you need a very, very quick early warning system if you're picking up that something is going wrong. That, in the end, comes back to then the risk profile of what it is you're actually doing mm -hmm. and whether the patient sees that as something with their consent that they're willing to take or not. So there's got to be a very clear discussion around the consent and what the potential impact and outcomes are around that. Otherwise, you will get into a situation where things that you don't want may happen and that's got to be prevented at all costs. Chris, are you in favour of, uh, uh, of adaptive algorithms? Uh, yeah, well, I think we have to, yeah. I mean, in one sense, you know, the algorithm improves with exposure to more data, and so you're limiting the algorithm by saying you don't want to do that. The question is how can we do that in a careful uh, manner? And, and so I sit on a panel with MHRA, so the, the regulatory body, and so examples like we would call something called batch updating, which is you, you train the algorithm, and then you kind of lock it down. You say, right, this is going to be the algorithm we're going to use. And then over time, you're gathering more data. And at a certain point, you might say, oh, we would like to retrain the algorithm. Now, at that point, you can kind of retrain the algorithm, but not have it actually delivering recommendations into the system, but just kind of running in background mode and just checking the validity. Has it improved performance? Is it robust? Yeah. And once you've gathered, you said, the evidence that if we had updated back here, 
yeah, this new algorithm is an improvement, then you can go back and then you can retrain. And so this idea of batch updating and monitoring, I think, is, uh, is the way to go. There's, a very, there's another kind of interesting question about the robustness, which is, you know, what we know is that as you gather more data, what that typically means is in slightly different populations. Yeah, and we know often that early adopters of technology and say healthcare, uh, you know, healthcare authorities will adopt at different rates and the populations will change. And then that's a very kind of interesting question is that if I take an algorithm that's been trained in central Birmingham, yeah, and I pick that up and I drop that into Belfast or I drop it into London, yeah, what are the consequences of that? You know, people live different lives across different cities, they have different lifestyles, they have different ethnic backgrounds. Yeah, so how can we really ensure that, that, that we're robust across training bases? I think that's a key question for us. Okay. Well, thank, you. thank you very much. I'm going to uh, finish with another kind of real-world example. When you get to my age, you go to your GP, they'll run an algorithm called Q-Risk, which is basically depending on your weight, your BMI, your cholesterol level, your glucose levels, what are your risk of you know, having a heart attack and so on. And they, um, they decide then maybe to put you on... Um, blood pressure medication if your blood pressure is too high and so on. So that algorithm was developed out of data acquired from tens and hundreds of thousands of patients in the NHS. So two questions, one for Fred and one for Angeliki. So Fred, first say, there's a new company, um, and this isn't too far from actually what's happening, but I, no names will be mentioned, that works with one of the GP health uh, software providers and, and says, okay, if you give me all your data, I think we can do better than QRISC, um, but I want to be able to sell that prediction algorithm to the NHS. Is that an ethical use of data? Um, so first question, they'll have another ethical issue for Angeliki to finish. Okay, so um, is that an ethical use of data? Um, I think ultimately if it is delivering increased patient benefit, then I think yes. Um, the question is really about um, what's a fair return in value and the, the commercial. You need to give a company a commercial advantage if they are actually going to deploy that system and get it out there. So to actually deliver impact, often having a commercial competitive advantage is, is fundamental to that process. But you obviously have to balance that with the fact that that uh, new improved system has been trained on a data set that's come out of the NHS. So I think you know, there's a very interesting set of models that we've seen Everywhere, everything from you know selling it or giving it free back to the NHS uh, and exploiting other uh, commercial parties, so the pharma industry or other healthcare provider systems, either the private in the UK or the, or the US model. And we've seen that full spectrum when it comes to reported outcome measures um, that uh, we manage. Uh, those are all provided free back to the NHS, but we you know, make sure that when they're used in a clinical trial by a commercial pharma company, appropriate value is returned back to the creators of that system. So I think it is, it's really about balance and finding what is an appropriate level, but with the ultimate aim of making sure that we're delivering the maximum impact on improved patient benefit in that, in that process. Thanks very much, Fred. That was very clear and took us to the whole spectrum, which is something I wanted to, to raise in case people want to follow that up later on. But final question, which is the last one before we open for the last quarter of an hour as scheduled, um, and just Angeliki for this one. So my data might have contributed to, because I've been around in the NHS long enough, to the QRIS score. Um, and a lot of people's data will have contributed, and you probably won't even have known about it, and you're probably okay with it. But actually now, um, for the first time this year, patients will be allowed to opt out of contributing their data, even for, say, QRIS 2 or QRIS 3. So I can go to my GP and say, well, I think it's a great algorithm, but I don't want my data to be shared to develop a better version of QRISC. Um, that's something that's being introduced in the NHS. Now, um, do you think that's the right thing to do? I mean, if, if really in order to make sure that we have the best possible prediction algorithm, surely we should want to have everybody's data anonymized and aggregated to have an even better prediction. Mm. So how do you balance the quality of the prediction versus the risk, the, versus the uh, ability or the right, I suppose, of patients to opt out? Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. And I think at the core of this is like, what, 
what do we owe to the NHS and what does the NHS owe to us in a way? What is that kind of social contract between us and, and the institution and the service that we provide? And in a way, I mean, that, that kind of the basic tenet of, the, of our social contract as it stands at the moment is that we contribute according to our means, we use according to our needs, and the NHS is there to ensure that our best interests as individuals but also as a society as a whole uh, are, are protected and served. Uh, and I think that is right and that this kind of basic social contract should remain. So now the question is, should you be able, to, as you say, to opt out um, from contributing to making the, the system much better? And I think it's a kind of a complex question um, there because at the moment uh, people are... One way that we contribute to the NHS is through our taxation. And we, as I said, people contribute to that according to their means and they use according to their needs. So whether we have that obligation to also contribute data, it's, um, it is, uh, I think it's, it's one that we need to consider, but also to consider how we're going to discharge that particular obligation for, for individuals. And I, I can see the benefit from, from saying that, yes, everybody should be able to, should, should feel that obligation to, um, to give that data to the NHS in order for the, the system to, uh, to improve. Uh, but that will rely on the individuals also having faith in the system that still kind of serves the public interest and serves the best interest. And that goes back to the points that you were making about mm -hmm. who would be allowed to have access to this data, how are you going to be used, uh, how the benefits are going to be then shared overall. Um, so, but I think that what we should never probably allowed to happen is that people are penalized for not contributing their data mm -hmm. to the NHS and I think that will go against the basic uh, relationship and the basic character of the healthcare system. There might be otherwise we would like to incentivize something like this to happen but restricting access to care should not be one of the ways we're doing this. So I'm not sure if I'm actually um, strongly answering your question. I think that um, it's it's, in, it's, um, it's a difficult one to answer. I don't think that we should be strongly obliged, but I think that we'd be strongly encouraged to do so. But th that kind of rediscussing again on what basis we're supposed to be doing this is exactly where the, the discussion needs to happen. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to add something before? Can I just add very quickly? Um, I, I think there's a pragmatic aspect to it as well. I think you know, the AI systems are very exciting, but the, without the data to train them, they're nothing. So I think as the people that are developing the technologies and as we're looking for the applications and how we are using that data, the spectrum from, you know, here's your, here's your three cancer treatments, probably on the wrong end of the spectrum, um, through to the, you know, the sort of, uh, we can actually tell that you're going to have a heart attack and we can treat you better right now and that sort of improvement. I think the onus is on us as those sort of uh, innovators to actually clearly demonstrate and define what the value is of the data being shared and used in this way. And I think that's, that's really the message that we need to work on. Uh, and there's definitely a more nuanced um, consent process required than simply you can con contribute your data or not. I think you should be able as an individual to say, yes, you can have my data, you can use it for this, but you can't use it for that. And I think that's where we need to be going.